Well, I'm pleased now to be joined by the editor of Vikings Territory, Dustin Baker, who covers everything related to the Vikings. Hey, how are you? Thanks for being with me. I am marvelous. How are you? It's great to meet you. I'm good. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's do a deep dive here into the team and really kind of focus on the draft. But first, um, I do want to touch on free agency. I mean, how would you grade what the Vikings have done in free agency? Ooh, on a strap budget, probably about a B. Yeah, I uh, thankfully, Zadaria Smith signed on a team-friendly deal. That fell out of the sky. And Vikings fans love turncoats when when the Packer, uh, when anybody from the Packers roster immediately comes to the Vikings, it's like a mini parade that's held. It's like, <laughs> why, what, what does this guy know that we don't? Uh, so it's really cool when a Packer becomes a Viking immediately. Other than that, the new general manager, uh, Quasi Adafaminso, was handed this tiny budget, said, figure it out. And he's a value-based human. And so, uh, of course... I am long standingly frustrated with uh, the offensive line, how the Vikings never seem to get it. Like I'm the only guy and me and my pals are like the only ones that understand that this is how you get to the postseason is to have good trenches. So I was hoping for a home run addition during this off season for a pass protector. They got some dudes who might be able to do it. Um, but if they would have done that, they would have gotten an A or A minus for me. But right now with Zadarius, probably a solid B. You know, you fall in line with some other really smart football minds I know that <laughs> talk about the offensive and defensive lines when it comes to really investing. And you see that in the postseason. But, you know, lately, especially, it seems like people are so quick to go for that big name wide receiver or, mm -hmm. you know, not even a running back anymore and and not focus on, like you said, pass protection or really just getting it done in the trenches, which if you talk to, you know, other guys who have been on the program who have either worked as GMs or been inside the league, you know, they'll tell you that you get that value back. Why do you think that the trend has been to look at the shiny objects, so to speak, for the Vikings instead of beefing things up where they really matter? Well, because the league, since Peyton Manning and the Broncos changed it almost single-handedly in a season and said, we're just going to throw the damn ball and have 55 touchdowns, it morphed into a league that, for, rightfully so, protects the health of players and the back, backdrop is driven by fantasy football. And then you can't hit guys anymore. You can't take heads off anymore. Like when I was a teen or a kid, used to watch football for that purpose of big hits. Uh, but here's the deal. So, and this Bengals example is going to set us back decades. Uh, last year at this time, the debate, you'll remember the memes too, was between uh, Jamar Chase or Penny Sewell. And you had dudes like me that are, if I cared about the Bengals, would be pounding the table saying, for the love of God, let's let's build the trenches. You've already got T. Higgins and the boys, A.J. Green, even though he left. Um, yeah, fortify the trenches and Joe Burrow can do the rest. Well, shame on me. They got Jamar Chase, who electrified the, the <laughs> league and the world, broke my guy Justin Jefferson's record, rookie record in the first year. And so they're vindicated. They got to the Super Bowl with leaky trenches. So my pals, they're like, well, look, the Bengals can do it. Why can't the Vikings? It's like, because Kirk Cousins isn't quite as good as Joe Burrow, homie. You can't figure that out. So, so it really I, does depend on how elite the quarterback is and whether yeah, they can get around it. If they can circumvent it. Yeah. And you'll have guys like Mahomes who, who can do it until it's the Super Bowl. And then he's exposed as well against the Bucs. Uh, but yeah, if you look at the correlation, the numbers, the d defensive trenches and offensive trenches, they determine and almost mandate if your team is going to reach the playoffs. You guys have the 12th overall pick, if I'm not mistaken, in the draft. Who are some players that Viking fans are hoping uh, will fall to them there? Sure. Uh, the, the team has a, a long term and arguably short term, uh, excuse me, short term, yeah, cornerback. And that should blend that 12 spot should be juicy enough to to do both, get the best player available and do roster needs. So before Sauce Gardner went and got all good at the NFL Combine, he was the number one with the bullet selection. Now he's going to go like in the top five. So the fan base has pivoted to Derek Stingley Jr. from LSU because about a bing, the Vikings have success in drafting LSU Tigers, whether it's Justin Jefferson, Daniil Hunter, or Henry Thomas 35 years ago. And then, by the way, Patrick Peterson, who went to LSU, would be his mentor in theory. So most of the fan base, I would say, is reasonably hoping Stingley falls to 12. Otherwise, with the value-based general manager I mentioned, you're probably looking at a trade back um, if they don't have the best player available. Because every time this dude, Quazy, gets in front of a microphone, he talks about value. He's an economist running a football team. So uh, Stingley would be the number one name. You always have the best player available argument with Garrett Wilson, just get richer at wide receiver, or Jordan Davis after his marvelous combine as well.
can you run a successful NFL football team uh, being uh, economically minded or do you need to figure out ways to get around salary caps and spend and bring in big name guys? Well, we're going to find out. That's for that's for sure. This is one of the first big uh, trials for such a young analytics based, um, you know, Edu- or Ivy League educated dude. Uh, the working theory is that he's been in the business now since 2013, watching how his peers do business. So he's going to blend both worlds, the gridiron part, the scouting part. And then, by the way, his background in economics. So um, I would be silly right now in his first offseason to say it ain't going to work. Um, but of course, just like everything that we talk about on these shows, it comes down to wins and losses in the regular season and then the postseason. But I do believe that this experiment will work because he's just so damn bright. You mentioned uh, Patrick Peterson. How important is it to have him back in the fold as a veteran leader, not only to potentially groom some of these young draft picks that come in if it ends up shaking out that way, but also, you know, you have a first year head coach and here's a guy who's a veteran who knows the program, um, you know, getting him back in the mix. Good thing, bad thing, great thing. It's a great thing because the way that the Vikings ownership, general management, coaching staff has decided in January was that this team can still contend. There was a lot of fans that thought nuke it, start over, get rid of cousins. Let's do it anew. But they didn't. They think that they can channel some of that Rams magic with Stafford and implement it with cousins. So Patrick Peterson said several times this offseason, I want to come back. And then it just never happened until it did. Uh, If indeed they are contenders and Peterson even said himself that he thinks the roster is stacked, then yes, you're going to need a voice like that. And it's just kind of cool that he wants to come back to the Vikings who, you know, did them dirty with an eight and nine season. You know, you could argue like that a team like Atlanta waited way too long to blow it up, but now they have made no qualms about the fact that they have pushed the rebuild button and they are fully in it. Do you think that this is the right move to, to extend this run with, with cousins and to not blow it up? Or is this a mistake? Well, I'll tell you what I think, but I can't speak for the masses. Um, I don't think it is a mistake because for two years, I've touted the efficacy of the roster, the playmakers on offense. And my mistake was not recognizing that Mike Zimmer all of a sudden wasn't going to be a very good defensive ball coach. I thought no matter what, whoever he had, they would always be good defensively. Alas, I was wrong. In the last two years, they've they've turned to poop for defense, and they've relied on an uh, offensive enterprise with a defensive head coach. So uh, I certainly could have gotten on board with the rebuild if they wanted to do it. However, their plan is to get with the times, and they hired an offensive-minded head coach who was young and sexy. And he's going to give it a whirl like, you know, Matt LaFleur worked with the Packers or Sean McVay, you know, the blueprint for this. Uh, so I, I strongly endorse giving it a shot for a year or two with well, all the while giving O'Connell a leash uh, to know that, you know, we could have rebuilt back in 2022, but we chose not to. Are the fans excited about Kevin O'Connell? I mean, what do we need to to know about this guy other than that the organization is betting on him to create some of that magic that we've seen from other new coaches? There was there was a roller coaster. I don't know how closely you follow the Vikings, but there was a three day window where Jim Harbaugh almost joined the team and people went nuts because he's guaranteed playoff relevance. And it was ties to Quazy from the 49ers days. So everybody rallied behind that. And then they like they met and they chatted for nine hours. And then the guy went back to Michigan and resigned there. Uh, So there was a a tiny little hangover that said, now what? Um, But when the fan base got to watch O'Connell go win a Super Bowl, it was like, okay, we're going to get some of this magic. We're going to channel this this young guy head coach thing. And yeah, he's every leader. They've trotted out these Vikings in the past three months from O'Connell starting with Quazy, I should say, and then even the defensive coordinator, Ed Donatel, they get on a microphone and you're like, geez, these guys are in- inspirational. And I'm trying to analyze it. Am I doing this? Am I, am I sold on this because I love the team so much? Or are these just genuinely good speakers? So I think they're saying the right things and we shall see in autumn. It's fascinating to consider how big of a part of that it is when you are trying to sell a new fan base to have somebody who can stand on their feet at the dais and really sell you and deliver. I mean, it's not unlike a, a presidential candidate, at least up front before the results come. Like you said, at the end of the day, it's about wins and losses. And then that leash gets really, really tight um, and people don't like you anymore. But, you know, when you think about productivity, wins and losses for this upcoming season, you said you do have some faith in the pieces that they have and believe that potentially this coaching staff is is the right fit. 
how many games do you think they can win? Is the division title within their reach this season? Well, yeah, but it's really not because the Vikings are so glorious. It's because the NFC North experienced the mass exodus of talent. And we, we did nothing to deserve it as the purple people. Uh, it just <laughs> happened. So Devontae Adams said sayonara. Uh, Akeem Hicks probably isn't coming back to the Bears, and he was a Viking killer. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, there was a couple other, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but there was a couple other notable, Allen Robinson from the Bears. Even He didn't do much last year, but he's a good receiver. So all of these guys are going to the AFC West and stuff and stacking those places, and we're like, good. And for, <laughs> for a while there, we thought Rodgers might uh, you know retire or whatnot. But yeah, suddenly the NFC North became the weakest division in football, and you have a recommitment from the Vikings ownership to try to go win the thing. So um, before seeing the draft, Oh boy. And seeing if this actually clicks, I'd say 10 and seven feels good uh, because they got to get a little deeper on the depth chart. But then it's one of those things. If, if in September, all of a sudden, if they start four and oh, and they get hot and this works, then you're looking at the sky's the limit because they have the playmakers to be very good. You know, you mentioned the rivalry with Green Bay and the exodus of Devontae Adams and all of that drama with Aaron Rodgers, which was kind of fascinating to watch. And I'm sure really exciting for Vikings fans to watch it all fall apart. And, you know, it's just interesting to analyze what Green Bay has done. Aaron Rodgers seemingly got himself into a, a mess. At one point, you thought that he and Devontae Adams were tied together and what they were going to do with their future. And now he finds himself still with Green Bay, but lacking a significant amount of weapons. You know, you could argue that Devontae, when in the games that he was, wasn't there, you know, they were still able to find a way to be productive. But in the games that mattered, he was hitting him time and time mm -hmm. and time again. I mean, their relationship knew no bounds. You know, are, are Vikings fans um, taking a little bit of, of joy in that? You mentioned the gift being dropped in their lap with the division getting mm -hmm. lighter in terms of individual playmakers. But I imagine that Minnesota fans probably loved to watch that all play out. Oh, hell yeah. We're taking a victory lap on that. Um, when they get weaker, we get stronger. And I mean, when they lost the 49ers, which like they do like every year, they go to the playoffs, lose the 49ers. It's glorious. You know, it, it's like a Vikings win. That's how sadistic we are uh, about this stuff. But I, I can't. I'm not going to sit here on your show and say, oh, yeah, the Packers are done because they lost Devontae Adams. They'll figure it out. They always do. Rodgers will elevate the next guy and they'll be just fine. But it's it's not going to be quite as easy. And um, yeah, so we do take joy. There's, there's no doubt about it. Anything that is at disadvantageous to the Packers, but then they end up getting, they go further in the playoffs. And then here we are just cheering for their demise. <laughs> um, one last one before I let you go, mm -hmm. just back to the draft. Um, how closely, and I saw on, on Twitter, and I know you've got a lot of stuff going on, you cover the Vikings very closely, um, and you were tweeting a bunch of preview draft stuff. You know, how closely do you watch what everybody else needs leading up to that 12th overall pick to try to read between the tea leaves and figure out who might fall, what needs you ultimately end up satisfying? I imagine even though the free agency period wasn't blockbuster with some of the stuff that we saw over in the AFC West, you know, you still managed to economically address maybe a couple mm -hmm. of different needs that you guys had which makes your focus more specific for the draft you know how do you kind of look at the thirty thousand foot view and go okay we're paying attention to xyz so that we can try to figure out ultimately what the vikings will have and won't have available to them by the time we get to pick oh yeah the the draft order ahead of minnesota matters monumentally even though i don't think it should because every team should just think they should just pick the best football player because nobody's gonna ever regret drafting Randy Moss when you already had Chris Carter and Jake Reed. You'd be silly. Same thing with Adrian Peterson. They, they didn't need a running back, but bada bing, they got one and it worked. So I, 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 you have to look at roster needs because some of these, these, these dumb teams that are at the top of the draft for a reason are trying to fill out a roster. Um, so I, I want to make sure I get that out there that I'm a BPA guy all, all around. Um, but as we talked about the top of our segment here, the, the world and the league is becoming quarterback heavy and consequently wide receiver heavy because somebody has to catch those balls. And when you are a, uh, a Vikings fan who's pining for a cornerback like Sauce or Derek Stingley, you start to look at the landscape of the teams before them and they're like, they're going to strike on a wide receiver because this is a pretty good wide receiver draft class. And then even though it's not a good quarterback draft class, they're probably going to reach for one of those guys to try to figure it out. I mean, the Carolina Panthers are going to be the prime suspect. So, for any team or the Vikings at 12 or the team after and the team after that, 
the more quarterbacks that are reached for or the more playmaker wide receivers that go off the board, then then the delectable defenders, the unsung guys, the edge rushers are going to be available. So that's what we're banking on, especially for the folks that that want a Stingley or a sauce is that quarterbacks are going to flood the market before the Vikings pick. I like the way you think, Dustin. Thanks for being with me. I appreciate the time. Best of luck to you this season. Hopefully we'll have you back after the draft or at least a couple weeks in the regular season. We'll see how this thing shakes out. Yeah, you hit me up and I shall join. Great to meet you.